Thank you. And with that, we'll start in with our first item on our work uh, session agenda tonight, and that's our branding discussion. Mr. Fearborn. Thank you, sir. Uh, as the council members present will uh, know well, we have been uh, engaged in uh, the groundwork and the trench work that's associated with uh, the branding effort. Uh, we have reached the, the point where the branding committee has had the opportunity to hear some of the recommendations and some of the background associated from uh, both Laura Lynch and Mr. Eakey and, and everything that's involved with that. And so tonight we are at the point where we'd like to uh, give you all a progress update and um, see what uh, the branding committee and, and uh, Lynchpin has come up with for us uh, at this point in time. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Eakey. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Fearborn. Before we jump into really the meat of the presentation, what I would like to do, uh, Ms. Hauk um, had previously shown this presentation and I wanted to give just a quick overview to bring everybody up to speed um, as we talk about what is branding and what is it that we'll be looking at tonight and along with some of the creative elements. And so this is just kind of a quick refresher of a presentation we saw, I believe, back in November um, about what branding uh, truly is. And I, I feel like the best way to talk about branding is to kind of set some limits and talk about what it's not. I think we have a misconception, uh, you know, a, a person outside of the communications department might have a misconception of what branding truly means to an organization. You know, a brand is not just the logo. Um, a logo is part of a creative element that actually is part of a greater brand story. And so, you know, if you think back to some of the logos that maybe stick out in your mind, whether they be city logos or private logos in, in you know, like the Nike logo, I think everyone is very familiar with, or the Apple logo, those are just one small part of an overall brand strategy. The second thing, a brand is not a tagline. You know, we are working tonight and we'll be seeing tonight a tagline for our community. But at the end of the day, a tagline really is just kind of your opening sentence, that opening statement that truly identifies your community um, within a larger, again, a brand story, a brand promise that we're going to be making to our residents. And the most important part, and this really is something that we cannot stress enough, the brand is not something that we say it is we are not able, whether in the communications department or through Lynchpin Creative, able to come up with a brand just out of thin air. The biggest part of this are the residents that we talk to and the residents that we involved, both through the research that Mrs. Lynch did as well as what we did through the branding committee. And that is an important part to remember as we move forward. So really when we bring all of these pieces together, whether the brand promise, our brand story, um, you know, our, our logo and our tagline, they're all coming together and they pull this thread through an overall brand for the city of Raymore. It gets to the heart of what our reputation, our personality, and our services and offerings really truly are within the community. And in order to do that, we had to set ourselves a mission. And that mission was to understand the community identity and develop that brand that exemplifies what makes Raymore excellent. There are many things that we all believe make Raymore excellent and we went to our residents and really asked them and got to the heart of the matter. And to help us with that mission and to help us with the overall uh, the project, we went to an organization, Laura Lynch, who has done not only work with us here at the city of Raymore, they helped us as we updated our, our logo and some of the coloring and branding several years ago. They've also worked with our economic development department, um, working with Matt Tapp and myself as we developed the Grow On campaign and several other creative pieces that he has used in that department. She's also worked with the city of Riverside, working on their annual progress report, monthly newsletters, various communications need, and also a branding development. She's also worked extensively with the city of Kansas City and many other local government organizations. And so she is no stranger to the needs and the, the kind of ambitions of a community like ours um, and, and being able to pull this kind of work together in an incredibly professional way. And so with that, I am excited to be able to hand this over to Laura Lynch of Lynchpin Creative. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, as everyone said, uh, we've been working on this work for quite some time and doing our background and doing our homework so that we could come forward to you with recommendations for the brand identity, which uh, Mike so perfectly explained. So what did we do? 
The first thing we do is look at your competitors. And by that, we took a look at some of the closest communities who were making an impact or might be looked at when people were looking to live, work, play in Raymore. So we wanted to see what are they saying, what do they look like? So at a glance, we have Lee Summit. You can see how they identify themselves uh, logo-wise. Uh, they are going with yours truly. Peculiar has the mark you see on the right, and they say where the odds are with you. Uh, Belton has the mark on the right, proud past, bright future. Grandview, building tomorrow's community. So we have some reference to what we're doing in the future, not so much where we are now, and just some kind of generic things. We have Lone Jack, uh, who really didn't have a tagline. We have Pleasant Hill, uh, who didn't have a tagline or really much of a logo, but they had a positioning line. We have Leewood, Kansas, who has growing with distinction, and we have a leaf. We have Overland Park, above and beyond by design, and we have the city of Raytown, who didn't have a tagline but had a mark. So that's kind of who surrounds you, and I'm gonna back up so you can kind of see. There's a lot of green and um, some trees. Just That's kind of the lay of the land, and that's, that's where we look first, just so we know where not to go, and so that we're aware of who's around us. Then we dig in and start to determine what truly sets your community apart. And as Mike said, we all know uh, each of you has an opinion, each resident has an opinion, but collectively when you do some research, kind of some highlights come through and that's what we set out to discover uh, with a very small uh, interview group. So what we did is talk to our audience and they represented residents and businesses and then we reviewed, digested, evaluated what we heard, and then based on what we learned, we developed key messages, a tagline, a logo, and potential campaign themes that are different from your competitors, authentic to who you are, relevant to your audience, and meaningful to you. If we leave one of those out, we don't have a good foundation for our brand. If we hit all of those, then we do. Those are the underpinnings, if you will, the four legs of the chair, four legs of the stool. So how do we do that? We talk to people, a local business owner who's also a resident, a Foxwood Springs resident, a city council member, a lifelong resident with a young family, a park board member, a newer Creekmore resident, and a business developer, just to kind of get a random sampling. Um, the questions that we asked were, uh, many and very focused and the first was how did you first learn about Raymore or how did you come to be associated with Raymore and we had a big brush stroke somebody has lived here since childhood uh, they used to think it was the boondocks somebody moved here because his wife got a teaching job uh, somebody else was a lifelong resident uh, oldest living resident continuously living here somebody else moved here from Brookside Somebody grew up here. Somebody moved from Raytown for a job as a police chief. Uh, somebody's husband was from here and he did not want to stay in Overland Park and he finally wore me down. This person had to be convinced and it was a years long process to move and now she loves it. Another person said, I saw the development boom happening here. I read about it in the newsletter and that's what drew them here. Then we asked, what was your impression before you experienced Raymore? The things that are in blue, obviously, are things we heard more than once. Boy, there's lots of growth. Uh, I'm gonna hit the repeat ones first. Lots of growth. Uh, three people said, I really had no impression, hence the need for branding. Uh, and someone else said, it's a very small town and, and very rural, and we had three people express that, which isn't quite right. Um, and then randomly we had, gosh, it's on the outskirts, it's a bedroom community, I thought it looked like a good value, it seemed secure, it seemed like great schools. That person really kind of got a snippet of what you're about. Uh, somebody else thought it was uh, horses, agriculture, there's just a little road. Uh, somebody else thought 
gosh, there weren't a lot of retail options, and another person's first impression was, there you have a fast pace of development thanks to the city. Then we asked, well, what was your impression after you'd been here a while, after you'd experienced it? Uh, and those were random but all positive. I love it. My family experiences like festivals, sports for the kids, and safe parks are great. It's close enough to the city. Uh, there was a lot of that. It's, it's away but close in. Uh, pleasantly surprised. It's not a farm town. There's lots of options. Lee Summit and Belton are close. It feels like kind of one general area. Somebody said initially it felt like a sweet little country town and community. Two people had touched on that. A few banks and a grocery store, cattle grazing, but it like is growing really fast. Um, more residential growth than commercial growth. Good schools, low crime. One person said, I got used to commuting for restaurants and shops. Belton meets a lot of those needs. A thoughtful and supportive community is how they see it. And someone said, the city is really good about focusing on growth. Then we asked, what's the one thing people should know about Raymore, but they don't? Four people touched on the thought of, people think it's farther away than it is. It's really closer than you think. Two people said the park system is pretty big for the size of city we are, and they cited trails, parks, and activities. Someone said twice, two people said the affordability of housing and variety of options, so that was cited, and the safety, good schools. Uh, there's more growth than you think. There's a lot of local businesses. You don't have to drive to the bigger cities. It's growing, things to do, not too big. It's the best of both worlds, community connection, but yet convenient to the bigger cities. And for businesses, the city officials are easy to work with and responsive. That's, that's the answers we got to what's the one thing people should know but don't. Then we asked what's the best thing? And we got a lot of variety here. The quality of life, the great place to raise children, the schools, People take pride in their homes and community, parks and rec, the city being supportive of local businesses, being able to work where you live, the community connection, and for businesses, everyone at the city being on the same page and easy to work with. So there were a lot of best things. A lot of those roll up into quality of life, rather you have a family or you don't, quality of life, and quality of um, your business's life and viability, really. So then we have to ask, well, what could be better? Having to leave Raymore to find certain things is frustrating. Boy, I wish it was more walkable and had a main street. Heard that a few times. I wish there was more retail, upscale restaurants and entertainment options. Options. Five people said that. And then we had a random smattering of just what individual people think could be better. Better traffic flow in 58. It's too hard to start a business or build a house in Raymore. That was unique because it kind of flies in the face of everything else we heard. But for someone, that was valid. Uh, some of the underdeveloped properties aren't maintained. The parks could be marketed better and have better signage. Uh, we need zoning to allow working and living in the same area, which kind of rolls up into walkable city center and Main Street, maybe. Uh, wanting higher quality of jobs in the area so maybe you don't have to commute to work. Better roadways, and for businesses, sometimes lower level city staff members aren't always as helpful as the people closer to the top. That's what could be better. Then we ask the one that I always preface and tell everyone before I ask it, here's the weird one, but it's an important one. And this question is, if Ray Moore were a person, what three adjectives would you use to describe it? The reason we ask this is part of your brand is your personality, and your personality has to have attributes in order to shape who you are. I like her, she's funny, I like him, he's poignant, right? Adjectives. So when we ask that question, these are the answers. And the larger words are the words we heard more often than not not only in this question, but in, in our answers that we got back in our conversations. This community is intelligent, it's growing, it's kind and inviting, it's compassionate, 
It's well-rounded, it's progressive, it's friendly and personable, it's laid back, it's welcoming, it's surprising, it's warm. And he had a couple negative words that popped up more than once, cluttered, but really reliable, youthful, intelligent, growing, kind, and inviting. So those words help inform the brand verbiage, tagline, key messages, look and feel. Last question we asked is why do you choose to live or locate a business in Raymore? What's your top three reasons? And you can kind of read all of these. They're various but yet specific. The schools, it's affordable, the people are great, it's beautiful, it's small town, the community is supportive of retail and business. You know, we had a lot of comments. City's supportive of our business. City staff is great. I like the relationships. It's good for my kids. It's safe. So these are things that we want to make sure we bring through in the branding. And the reason we ask these questions is not only do all of you have an opinion, but as we get to know communities and clients, we start to get opinions too, but our opinions don't matter. What matters is the opinions of the people that we're talking to that we are trying to attract more of. So the people that we talk to, those names were provided for us as examples of, we want more of that here. We want more of those types of residents and business owners. These are who we wanna to attract to grow our community. So from all of that, we sifted to come up with things that, that make Raymore different from competitors, authentic to who you are, relevant to your audience, and meaningful to you. Things that shape Raymore as a community. And these were the differentiators we came up with. It's the best of both worlds. It's a family-friendly, connected to community. Raymore's ready for business, and we love our town. And then we develop messaging around each of these four key differentiators. The best of both worlds. Raymore offers the safety and spirit of a small town with easy access to the greater metro area. And our plentiful housing options from starter to luxury make it easy for you to call Raymore home. And as you'll recall, this is it's the feedback that we received. Next key message. It's a family-friendly, connected community. Raymore is home to exceptional schools, youth programs, holiday events, walking trails, parks, arts festivals, the new center view building, along with the planned development of a recreational activity center, parks improvements, and more. So the community you've created is family-friendly and very well connected, and that's valued. And not just by residents, but developers as well. Three, Raymore is ready for business. Raymore's committed to connecting business owners and developers with building sites, existing locations, workers, and customers. Your goal is to give residents more ways to dine, shop, and even work in Raymore. And the last key message, we love our town. Raymore was formed in 1858 from nothing more than grit, pride, and vision. Here, roots run deep. Our pioneering spirit continues to motivate and inspire us as we shepherd our community today and for the next generation. There were a lot of uh, comments about being proud of the community, how it looks, how it feels, I know my neighbors, it's safe, I care about it. And uh, that is not something you can create or earn. You know, you, you, you have pride or you don't, and it's, um, it kind of permeates all the conversations that we had. So from those key messages, we developed a recommended tagline to capture all that. And that tagline is this, come home to more. Raymore, come home to more. And it might go like this, more reasons to come home, more ways to thrive, more things to do, more to love. So these are campaigns and themes that we would like to explore and that we think could help get the word out and market Raymore in a variety of ways to help you connect the audiences that you want and need most. So from that, we created a mark. And again, that mark 
relevant, different, authentic, and true to who you are that could support your vision and who you are today and the hearts and minds of the people that you want to attract more of. And what we recommend is this, Raymore, come home to more. And that might express like this on a billboard or like this or like this on a banner or like this on your new water tower or like that after you've run a 5K and you're handing those out to every participant or of course the shirt. That's our recommendation. That's where our research led us. Question. Sure. What does the um, icon, what's the concept of what depicts, what is that depicting? That icon is a, an adaptation of the center of your sculpture that will be at the entrance of your city. That is something that you and you alone can reflect. That sculpture will be your, here we are, you're in Raymore now. So we felt we had a rare and unique opportunity to capitalize on that and create something that was as authentic and individual as Raymore is. So that's why we did that. So that's the very center of your sculpture. Mm -hmm. That will be such a visible uh, icon and a visible welcome mat for the city that it just seemed uh, not only inspiring but uh, logical. That's, you're not in Belton. <laughs> That's gonna be yours. That board represents the actual true colors. It's very hard on a screen to always uh, depict accurately and the color chips show the actual logo colors. I was just saying that's good to see because that looks purple and yellow and I don't think it's yeah, going to be purple not. and yellow. You know, and every screen, that's the problem. That's why we provide the real deal. Thank you, Kevin. Mm, that depicts it a little bit better. That one was black when we first saw that. It was black. Mm. And that blue is pretty close on the, on the paint job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you do a logo, you create many variations so that you can apply it on something dark like that. That's just our reverse logo. But we chose to recommend popping out the gold Mm -hmm. right. I threw a lot at you. Right. It's important. And I had a, had a reaction to it initially, too, because it's so different from this. Uh, that, uh, you know, but, but when you start thinking about it, and, and you're thinking about the, what it, the, the, the uniqueness of it all, the use of the term more, uh, because we do believe we provide more. Sorry to folks at home. Uh, we just... That's the one that the, that the group felt like we needed to uh, push forward to uh, the council uh, for your consideration. Like I said, I know that's a lot to take in and um, 
may need time for it to soak in and, and develop questions at a later time. Did you have something, Kevin? I just want to comment. I, I like it because it's just simple. I mean, it's really effective and it's simple. And I know the, the little emblem up there, you know, it's kind of like any time you put something up, somebody looks at it and they see something different. I kind of look at that and see outstretched arms, like <laughs> welcome. That's what it reminds mm -hmm. me of. So when I see that, it's very appealing. It's got a welcome look to it and then come home to more. I mean, I, I like it, simple. Good job. Thank you. We felt like um, you have such a great opportunity with that, that sculpture and the investment that you're making in art to be the, your gateway piece that um, it just afforded a uniqueness that, you know, we can create all kinds of really neat marks and it's just a neat mark. But this is a mark that's you, that nobody else can, nobody can do that because it's your, it's your piece and that seed and that seed itself, as you said, it's very welcoming. That sculpture is welcoming. So we just felt like it was ownable and defendable as your own. Okay. Well, Let's as do next, Michael. well as we've given you a lot to digest, what we would like to do is bring this back to the first work session in June, um, and then we will take our steps from there. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Kevin. You didn't introduce Kevin. Did you want to introduce Kevin? He's actually came up with <laughs> So Kevin's firm and I have worked together for a number of years. We worked together on uh, several accounts and I brought his team in to develop the mark. So, and we've just kind of worked on projects like this for years and uh, he has reshaped the branding for the city of Mission. So Kevin's no stranger to this work either. So. I just felt like they were the perfect fit to do this project, so. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Right. Uh, next item on the agenda is the street preservation program. Take it away, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, sir. If you, uh, Mr. Council, I uh, just need to get organized here a little bit. All right. In the meantime, can I yes. ask a question? Can you help me understand why we have our speakers at the back of the room and the presentation up there? Is there why don't we have our people sitting where we can see people in the presentation? Is that Only so they can see it, so they know what's up there. If they have their backs to it, they can't see what's being projected. Okay. I'm, I've just always wondered that. It seems silly that we're like watching a tennis match. <laughs> <laughs> Most, uh, what I noticed when we first started this and we had them there, everybody's looking up above their head anyway. Nobody's trying to do that and they really need to see what's being presented. All right, um, what I'd like to do this evening is uh, present a summary of our uh, pavement management plan, uh, which, is, which provides the framework for, of our annual capital improvement plan that's related to uh, street maintenance. Uh, I'd like to, I wanna acknowledge uh, Phil Becker who manages this project, uh, he's the one that gathers the data, he's the one that I drive crazy with asking for additional scenarios uh, with regards to how we can util best utilize our dollars. I also like to thank uh, Mike Eakey for helping us pull together the presentation in the form that, that, you, uh, that you see it this evening. Um, <clears throat> want to just, because uh, it's been a while since we've, we've talked about this in, in depth, want to kind of start with 
what is a pavement management system? And we do follow best practices as outlined by um, American Public Works Association. And what, what it does is it's a, it's a set of tools that helps us evaluate the condition of our, of our streets, um, helps us look at the best ways to spend our maintenance dollars and keeps the pavement serv serviceable. Um, we take into account, uh, we actually physically survey the streets, um, take into account all the various defects that are within the, in the uh, se roadway segments, that is put into a software program and then it produces a, a rating and also then a, a, some recommended maintenance practices. Streets are, streets are rated and the rating that comes out as you see, we, the first thing we do is a system in, uh, inventory. We then do a condition uh, survey, which then uh, results in a, uh, what we call a pa pavement condition index. And our, our goal is to, as much as we can, keep the, uh, as much of the network as we can above a PCI 55. That's really the break point between where we can spend maintenance dollars on, on routine maintenance versus where we have to get into the more aggressive mill and overlays or, or reconstruction. So we use a combination of repair strategies, our budget, council goals, as far as where we want, where we want to go. And really, it's very, the system and our maintenance strategies are very, very similar to maintaining your vehicle. You know, there's different, different maintenance activities you do as, as a car, as a vehicle ages. Um, it may start out early as preventative maintenance, where you do an oil change, fluid change, tire rotation, those type of things. Uh, our preventative maintenance program consists of, first and foremost, it does not include chip seal. Uh, we do microsurfacing instead of chip seal. Chip seal is where you put down an as asphalt and then put rock on top of it, come back and sweep it up. I think if you've been following this at all, Belton, has done something like that. Uh, I do recommend, and I think it performs well on, on some of our low volume rural roads, such as Lucy Webb and Prairie Lane, but in residential streets, it's, it's a good product. It's just, there's such a process you have to go through to get it um, <clears throat> to a final state that we feel um, the microsurfacing is a better, is a better way to go. So um, what we, what we attempt to do through the routine maintenance is keep moisture out of the pavement, out of the subgrade. Moisture is really our enemy. It softens the subgrade, allows freeze-thaw cycles to impact the pavement. So uh, first thing we do is we want to look at crack sealing the roads. You'll see that that's where the, they actually use a hot asphalt, pour it into the cracks, spread it out a little bit to seal it. You'll see it looks like the, the, the black strips on the, on the, on the uh, <clears throat> street. What we've done uh, as an additional measure to that uh, starting last, last year or the year before, we also put a, um, a seal coat on there. Um, what that does is you can only crack seal um, cracks of a certain size and the smaller ones, it's really not cost effective to do. So the seal coat on top of that helps seal the pavement surface. It also helps reduce oxidation of the pavement. Oxidation of the pavement leads, leads it to getting brittle. And once it gets brittle, it starts acting pretty much like concrete. It's susceptible to expansion and contraction. That's why in a lot of areas in the older pavements, you see that crack that's all the way across the pavement. The pavement's gotten brittle and it starts reacting to uh, contraction and expansion, contraction when it's colder, expansion when it's, uh, when it's warmer, and, it, and that's, how it, uh, <clears throat> that's how those cracks form. We also have, you know, part of this is pothole patching or some other types of patching. So as the pavement pavement ages, we get into more of a rehabilitation type program. This is, you know, where your car, where you start looking at brake pad replacements, bearings, um, those those type of things, ball joints, a little more aggressive maintenance on your vehicle. This is where we do a little more aggressive uh, maintenance on the streets. A mill and overlay, we will take the pavement surface completely off, typically about an inch and a half of pavement, put put new asphalt back on. That's what we did with uh, 58 Highway uh, recently. Also, full depth patching. Um, we've done quite a bit of that on Creekmore Drive where the pavements failed and we go in, take out a patch, put re, re, uh, <coughs> reestablish the, the stability of the subgrade and then 
replace, do a full depth as asphalt replacement. And that, that, uh, full depth patch, that's, that's generally done in house, isn't it, Mike? Didn't we uh, it depends on the it volume of it, sir. Some of it we do include in our when we when we are in that mode. Uh, we will include that in our street preservation program as, as well. Some of it's done ahead of a mill and overlay. Some of it is just done because we can't keep up like in the Eagle Glen area, um, north of Johnson Drive, south of the apartments. There's just some roads there that have deteriorated and were um, just from the construction traffic that we went in there and had the contractor patch those. Okay. And then finally is the total reconstruction, something similar to what we did on Johnson Drive where we take the road all the way back down to, to subgrade and then re rebuild the road from the bottom, the bottom up. One of the, one of the <clears throat> kind of counter and counterintuitive things with the program is that you really want to spend your, you get the most bang for your buck on your maintenance dollars when you can spend it early in the in the road life. When we're looking at the routine maintenance, the crack sealing, the the uh, microsurfacing, and those those type of, of uh, activities, because we can cover more of the road network for a for a given dollar. So what what you see is this is a typical pavement decay curve, um, and where we are where we are looking at. Um, dollar costs uh, for various act activities. So where the roads are in, you know, the fair, fair and above, we're looking at spending spending a dollar or so per on a given square quantity of road. As you get further down, you have to invest more dollars, which means you use, you're able to cover less of the roadway network. Um, where we are here is this is kind of a snapshot of the road conditions prior to our recommendations for this year. Um, for, the, um, for the newer, uh, in general, we follow the recommendations of the, what comes out of the street pavement management plan with regards to our maintenance activities, but every so often um, we have to deal with the, the poor and the very, very, very poor roads. Uh, so what we will do is do a reset year like we're proposing this year where we will do some extensive <coughs> mill and overlay in the in the residential neighborhoods. We um, may add in a, a thoroughfare route, uh, as in this year we are recommending uh, Lucy Webb Road, and that just gets gets the uh, the condition of the network back up to where we are more in the in the fair the fair con category. So really, the what Can I the ask a question real quick. Sure. Before we move on. So looking at the, the picture that shows kind of the de decay of the roads and correlating that with the, your kind of maintenance schedule you had. Mm -hmm. So like, would, would it be fair to say that the, the roads that are green just need the preventative maintenance and when we get down to the orange ones, we're looking at the rehabilitation and when we get to the red, we're looking at reconstruction? Um, not quite that. When we get down to the red, we may be looking at either a deeper, uh, mill and overlay or reconstruction, but yes, and then moving moving on up from there, yes. So maybe more because not not everything that falls into the poor category regard re requires us to completely build from the bottom up. We can we can do a lot with it. We may do a deeper mill and overlay where we normally do an inch and a half. We may do two inches. We may do three inches. Uh, we may do a little more extensive base repair, but um, that's it. Doesn't necessarily mean we're totally reconstructing the roads. That's not fair to try to correlate those. <laughs> <laughs> well, to a certain extent, the, the top two, I think you're, you're correct. Okay. The, the, and the difference from the layperson's standpoint before Mike over talks me, because <laughs> he always loses me with this, is that a road can go into a poor condition, but it's a surface issue rather than having, when we get into reconstruct, there's, we have a base issue. Uh, an example, and Mike was gonna use it, so I'm gonna steal a little bit of your thunder if it's okay. When we start talking about like Creekmore Drive, there are areas of Creekmore Drive because of the traffic on top that the surface is what has led to the poor condition because of the heavy construction traffic. But there are also areas where when they constructed it, the subsurface of the actual street. So there'll be areas of Creekmore Drive when we get into it this year that 
we're actually having to reconstruct in areas that a deep mill and overlay can do. Is that ducky horsey? Mike? Yeah, and it, it, it really depends. The, the maintenance activity, you know, the program is a tool. There's still judgment. So there's, there's different types of triggering action. So as Mr. Fearborn said, a, a poor road that requires re reconstruction. If you remember Johnson Drive, there were, there were deep ruts, there were humps. You know, and so that's indicative of a, a subgrade failure. If there's a lot of alligator cracking, that's indicative of um, subgrade failures that need to be addressed in, in something more than just a mill and overlay. You can have a number of other defects that are cumulative that still gets it into the, the poor category where we may need to go deeper than just an inch and a half overlay. So I... <laughs> So really what we do with the, with the pavement management system is it's the right treatment at the right time on the right road and just maximize the, the dollars that we are basically um, use them the best we can to get the best impact, most impact. Um, so what I also have any, I'm sorry, any, any other questions? Then what I'd like to do is um, refer you to the 2017 street preservation plan that we handed out. And uh, we've got a list of streets and I do have, I apologize it didn't get included. Mr. Barber, if you, do you mind, could you pass that around? I do have a map that shows the locations of the streets we're gonna be to be working on. Nope. Did that one come along? Yeah, don't. <laughs> That'll be coming around next. <laughs> nope. Sorry. There you go. So I said, as I indicated, this year's, this year's program is um, extensively a, a mill and overlay program where we're gonna be addressing the poor and, and very poor streets throughout the, throughout the city. Some of these uh, you may recognize that having contact on, um, you know, for example, uh, Pacific, the, the cul-de-sac just a few blocks from here has been kind of a chronic, chronic sense. Uh, we've gotten a number of complaints about that. And uh, Creekmore Drive, now that we've been able to divert some of the construction traffic, we'll be doing, doing some things there. Um, I do wanna point out that uh, the estimate you see before you, uh, if you recall the last few years, we've been using a cooperative bid with the city of Belton. This year, uh, Peculiar took the uh, lead on um, bidding the project out. We've taken a look at it and uh, the numbers that they've got are very attractive, and so what we anticipate, uh, subject to any modifications from council this evening, the next step would be bringing forward a contract for your consideration with the, uh, as soon as Peculiar completes the bid award with that, and I believe the low bidder is, uh, that they are gonna be selecting is Superior Bowen. Superior Bowen has been doing, has done quite a bit of work for us in, in the past, and uh, so you'll be seeing that before you shortly. Yes. I'm gonna ask for some clarification. Um, item number 15 on the preservation map location, location map, it says Lucy Webb. Then we go over to the streets of Mill and Overlay and where it speaks of Lucy Webb, it says from Adams to Silvertop. The highlighted area seems to be shown from I believe is, looks like, is that Silvertop Lane there? Down mm -hmm. to uh, North Madison. No, there's a, there's, a, there's a little stub that extends a little bit, one block past um, Madison Street. Yeah. And that'd be to Adams. 
Okay. Actually, okay. I thought you were gonna bring up the extension from Silver Top down to the opening no, of Cedar no, no, Ridge. No, 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 no. Because there's a, there's a no. little bit of a... Okay, I, I was mistaken because uh, it, it does correlate, but my question would be is, isn't, wasn't that on our, our previous geo bond to redo most of that section? Particularly there where the, is adjacent to the park? I thought, I, I thought we redid that, that road with the last geo bond. We did reconstruct that road. That was ten, almost 10 years ago. And we are having some uh, pavement issues there where the surface is starting to ravel. Um, you'll notice some of the, some of the uh, patching that we've, we've been um, doing there. Uh, we've taken some cores and the uh, asphalt content has, um, it's one of those situations where the pavement is oxidized and it's actually starting to, starting to break down. So it's, um, that it's about 10 years, so you know that's pretty typical for a collector street that gets the traffic that the, that does to look at a mill and overlay um, about every yeah, 10 see, years. See, Kevin, if you hang around on the city council long enough, we actually get back around to some of the same streets. Well, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I have because I remember that sign. I remember Mayor Alonzo, you know, just you know, and, and rightfully so. He he was really crowing about it, and, and that was great because that was a, a huge deal, you know. But it, it just, I guess, what it does, it it, it speaks to our, our volume of traffic also through that area, you know. And, and I'm not I'm not slighting staff or anything. It's just that, boy, I, I wish that that geo bond money that we, we spent 10 years ago lasted a little bit longer, but it really doesn't. So I, I you know, I mean, this is, this is kind of uh, Go ahead. showing, Thank you, sir. I, not so much my age or my, my tenure on the but council. You are. It's just my yes, frustration that I wish money would last longer than it does. <laughs> not, probably not as much as I do, sir. And of course, uh, we'll be seeing uh, in a shorter time period, in fact, we saw 58 Highway having to be redone because 58 Highway went from the federal incentive funds, which were after the bond issue, to this particular bond issue, and it was actually the first item out of the chute on this bond issue. Uh, Lucy Webb is, gets a tremendous amount of traffic, as you as you all know. Uh, one of the things that I that I think is is interesting on this is, and Mike and I were discussing it this afternoon because I had the same feelings um, the the amount of deterioration that we see on the east west routes compared to the north south routes even if they're collectors so yeah actually we're get, that road's going to get used quite a bit when they start the final phase of evanbrook too because that'll be the main thoroughfare in and out of evanbrook down sunset there yeah, and, and I, I realize that it just it just speaks to the our, our need as a community for having more access east and west than than more than what we we have because when we look at it basically we have two east and west routes all the way through town and uh, we are a growing community. We're, you know, I, I suspect the next census we will probably be the biggest one in in Cass County. But uh, I, again, I, no, no slight to staff. It's just, I, boy, I, I, I wish that infrastructure would last longer than it does, but it speaks to, to our growth and our needs in, in our community. Uh, again, the importance of driving people uh, on the south side of Lucy Webb to North Cass Parkway, which the council is making efforts to do. Um, getting people uh, alternative routes to get up to the short stem of 58 highway uh, the council is doing that in the geo bond with johnson drive and with fox ridge um, the the importance of the work that we're going to be doing separate and apart from this on 155th street uh, all east west routes important important that we recognize the at, at this point in time, we'd love for the north-south routes to be being used for people to get from their homes to a place of business in Raymore. Next conversation at a future date with the council. Um, but right now, people need to get out of Raymore in the morning and get back in in the evening. So those routes are gonna get used. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, did you have something, Sonia? Do you have more to present? I just want one well, other I would, question. I was kind of waiting for questions on street preservation. If not, I was going to roll into our uh, our curb replacement program. 
Go ahead. In that case, I have a question about streets. Just because I know it will come up since we're talking about it tonight, everyone in Ward 4, not everyone, lots of people in Ward 4 are very concerned about Ward Road. So I understand it's quite expensive to do much with Ward Road and that it's on the edge of town. So just will you help explain a little bit about how much it would cost to do any work on Ward Road because it's in such poor shape? Because I know you can explain it way better than I can. <laughs> well, one of the one of the bigger challenges we have with Ward Road because we do just like with Prairie Lane, we do um, quite a bit to uh, keep the area in front of Ward Park Place in serviceable condition. Um, the vast majority of that um, almost mile and a half segment within the city from 58 Highway to the North City limits is in Cass County, and so that that's the biggest challenge is. You know, we can take care of the small segment that's within our our community on our half of the road, which is, um, you know, Ward Park Place, um, Alexander Creek, and then Chateau Place. And but then we still have the east side of the road, and then that whole segment to to 58 Highway. Um, you know, to, to you know, we're looking well over to reconstruct the road, get it get it drivable, to do something similar to what we did uh, with Johnson Drive and kind of match up with what Lee Summit has done to the north, you're looking well over a million dollars a mile. Uh, the, we've approached Cass County several times on that and to partner and they just do not have those kind of dollars available to, to partner with us. Thanks, Mike. And I have heard that before and I know that, but people still have that question. It comes up a lot um, for those of us representing Ward 4, but I am, happy to see that um, the routine maintenance out at Ward Park Place, Alexander Creek and Knoll Creek, um, sometimes those people that are out on that far end of town feel like they're kind of forgotten. So I am happy to see and just want to point that out if, if people don't see that, that there will be the patching and crack seal programmed for those neighborhood streets for this year. Thanks. Any other questions regarding uh, street president our street maintenance program? If not, then I will. No, you've already got one of those maps. <laughs> Just send that one around too. I think I've got enough copies for everybody. Mike. Yep. <laughs> I was just waiting for the map to go, oh. go around. <laughs> so, um, give you, we're going to start with a little bit of history of the um, the curb curb replacement program. Um, this is not a unique issue to Raymore. It's not a unique issue to the Kansas City metro area. It reaches. It's a regional issue. Uh, it's far far west as Lawrence, Kansas, um, is having this these same these same issues. Um, kind of came to um, to the attention Overland Park and some of the other cities a number of years ago. Noticed that the curbs were um, starting to, to count the concrete curb and gutter was deteriorating at a very accelerated rate. Um, you can look at some areas of cities where there's you know concrete approaching 100 years old that is sound and what they were finding is they had curb that was you know similar to what we're experiencing less than 10 years old was de completely deteriorating um so they formed what uh was f called the uh, kansas city Met uh, metropolitan materials board they started taking a look at things and what they found is um, part of the reason that there's kind of a break, you know, you'll see older concrete that's really sound and then newer con concrete is, is not, is that in this area we've um, kind of run out of the durable limestone, that which it makes up the aggregate in the, 
in the concrete. It's very, the limestone we're left with is very susceptible to um, hanging on to moisture. It also doesn't react, uh, it creates a reaction with the, the cement paste where it doesn't, the concrete doesn't necessarily cure completely and it's very susceptible to the freeze thaw cycles that we see here in, in the Kansas, Kansas City area. So what they did is they started uh, actually importing aggregate from Arkansas, they brought, brought in aggr uh, granite aggregate. And several years ago, uh, we, uh, we also s switched, it wasn't readily available, then it became more and more um, as they started using it more and more, it became a ready source. They used to have to bring it in every year, they got together like we did our, with our pavement on a, on a joint bid, figured out how much they needed and actually brought it in on rail cars so to use and, and mix in. So. Uh, as that has evolved, it's become more of a available and ready, um, ready material, and we switched to it uh, not only a number of years ago on our city projects, that council also uh, made a code change several years ago where all, within all the developments, and in fact, all exterior concrete has to use uh, the granite aggregate in it. So we, uh, on, uh, starting in 2008, we started uh, kind of a, contracting it because we noticed that it was um, well beyond what our operations and maintenance could repair to replace on an annual basis and then developed a long range um, curb replacement program where we systematically rate the curbs uh, based on their deteriorated condition. Um, we've kind of evolved the program uh, several, several times. Uh, Two generations ago, if council recall, uh, operations and maintenance had identified a number of driveways that were deteriorated, and we incorporated those into the uh, to the program because that's what folks were really complaining quite a bit about is the tire they'd grab their tires when they went into their driveways. I'm pleased to uh, announce we've made a considerable progress in that. In fact, this year I think we've got less than 200 feet of driveway curbs that we that we've identified as being replaced. So we're kind of cycling back into our more systematic uh, curb replacement. Uh, what you have before you is the, the new five-year plan based on our um, recent surveys. And then last year we made a, did another change where we, um, when we replace curb, because we've seen some better performance with the, what we refer to as the high back curb, that's the curb with the more vertical face rather than the curb, the rollback or rounded curb that you see in your driveways. Uh, we've gone and um, gone to any areas where we are replacing curb. We are using the high back curb. Uh, it has caused the um, program to be extended a little bit because when we replace in between driveways, we go from driveway to driveway. So that so we're not left with one with four transitions. You know the, the high back curb, then transition down, then transition back at the at the driveways. So. Um, Based on the survey we have here, just based on deteriorated curb, there's about 85,000 feet of curb that needs to be replaced. We've outlined another uh, five-year program that you see in, in the map here. Uh, this year's program is shown in, in red on the map, and then we are moving, uh, moving forward from there. So again, what I'd be looking for is um, either any modifications council may wanna make, otherwise this will sh provide the framework for our uh, bid package that we would then put out on the street for a solicitation from contractors. Mike, if you could also remind the council and for the sake of the new council members, your boots on the ground, guys in the field survey that they do each year when they're actually out there replacing curb, because we're gonna be withholding some money back from the program for that again this year, correct? Uh, actually, very little. That's the, we, we have really eaten into that backlog. Thank you, sir. As I said, we're down to, yes, the, our, our maintenance folks do identify other areas because they'll get calls and, and they will provide us with lists of areas that um, just aren't worth patching because they do do quite a bit of patching of curb and we're down this year to only about a, of 158 feet of curb. So that's about five driveways, five or six driveways that from the, the last few years, I think we had allocated uh, Fifty to sixty thousand dollars of this program to do to do driveways. So I think we've we've caught right now we've caught up quite a bit on that, and so we're just moving forward with the uh, the typical curb replacement within the zones. Anybody? 
anybody have anything? With that, I'm available for questions. Sure. Quick question. I think you touched on it earlier. I just need to clarify from my own understanding. Um, the driveway, when you say driveway replacement, uh, as I was walking around campaigning, I noticed even in my development, um, there's the portion of the driveway that, you know, from the curve to probably a good foot that seems to be deteriorated and crumbling and such. When you say driveway replacement, is that what you're talking no, about? No, it's strictly the curb, the sir. Curb. The, the, okay. the driveway approach is the homeowner's responsibility. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sonia? Thank you. I have another quick question, just, just because this is always fun to hear. <laughs> You're looking forward to it, aren't you? <laughs> As it was today in Mr. Fearborn's office, I can assure you. So. <laughs> um, so in your opinion, Mike, do you feel like our budget supports roads and curbs? I mean, we can always do more. We could always have them perfect. But as far as keeping us in a good place, do you feel like you have the budget that helps to keep us out of those orange and red areas as much as we can and keep things looking respectable? I, I think our road network is very strong. I think council has been very supportive of the programs. I think more importantly, um, the budget that council has established um, is sustainable. I think when we, when we do find roads that are um, outside the norm, the council's been supportive of that, and we look at those on a, a single project basis, like 155th Street or, or 58th Highway. I think the most important thing is, is that uh, the road network is very sound. Um, I think we do, council has provided ad adequate funds and it's sustainable. And there, and at one point, like seven or eight years ago, didn't you guys go on an accelerated curb replacement program? Thank, thank you. I mean, no, go ahead. No, actually, there's been an evolution. I mean, when we first did this, the, we were only funded at four hundred thousand dollars, and then at, with, I'm going back to the pavement management. Um, I'll start there. We were only funded at, at about four hundred thousand dollars a year at um, what the pa what the pavement black box computer program had projected um, a need of $1.2 million a year. We kind of spoke with council, um, developed this program where we will address the poor roads every so often and do a reset and um, settled on a budget that was sustainable about $800,000 a year. The other thing we did was we took the separated the thoroughfare routes out, um, taking a look at what other funding sources were available. Taking the thoroughfare routes out allows us to concentrate more on the local road network and the thoroughfare road routes, the maintenance on those is funded through the excise tax. And so we're able to capture some of those, some of those dollars. Um, the curb program as well, um, we took a look at, we up the fund, council up the funded there, and we also uh, incorporate, because it is an integral part of the stormwater conveyance system, we are also using stormwater dollars to help supplement the, the, curb, the curb replacement budget as well. Short form is, council was very innovative and forward thinking in the use of the funds for our infrastructure. And with some, some tweaking, which is what Mike calls the reset years, between that and the dramatic increase, three times the funding that we saw just four years ago, uh, we are certainly doing a lot more now and as much as is possible to address, in a fiscally prudent manner, to address both curb and street issues. Sure. So on page 15 of our packet where it says continued funding at the current level of $800,000 per year will not maintain the local street network at the current average pavement index. So to me that says we need to be planning or saving or preparing to have more money to put into this program. Is that true? Help me with that. I think what, when I, when I look at that, um, I think we have we've got a couple of couple of issues that are kind of fighting fighting us here, and it, and it really goes to whether or not the budget is sustainable. Um, I, I don't think, from a sustainable standpoint, because of the way our our um, road network has evolved. I mean, we, growth is a good thing. 
you know, a lot of subdivisions, a lot of that, but all the, all the pavement's the same age then, and it's all deteriorating at the same, at the same time, and it creates a large mass of the road network that needs to be addressed, uh, addressed. So looking at where, where it is and, and um, w as we said, making with the adjustments that we make from time to time to address some of the, some of the, poor, um, the poor roads or the roads that need more attention, I, I don't know that it's a, um, from the, again, the strength of the roadway network, um, I'm looking at page 16 of the report. I don't know that it's a bad thing that we start approaching more of a bell curve in our, with our road network, you know, because there's really, um, other than looking at some some defects that the the layperson wouldn't wouldn't uh, pick up on, the difference between a good and satisfactory road is, it's still drivable, it's still smooth, it's there's not a lot of difference. I mean, the, it's very subtle differences between the, even the good, the satisfactory, and the fair the fair roads. As you start sliding further down, that's when you start seeing some of the rideability issues, the 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 crack across the pavement that hits your tire every you know. 40 or 50 feet that that people really really notice some of the dips in the road as you're as you're driving it but I don't I don't think it's a it's a bad thing that the roads the road starts approaching more of a a bell curve for the condition ratings I think having it top weighted is is just not statistically valid and it's not really maintainable uh, I would also add that and Mike actually is first line we're getting more roads now the roads are initially paid for by the development that is going in, but now the roads in the initial spurt of growth that we had, so from a budgetary standpoint, uh, my recommendations to the council uh, will in the next two to three years involve an increase in the budgetary cycle over and above the 800,000 as the baseline. By then, our hope is that the economic development growth that we have, that the excise tax growth that we see in any time a home gets built or somebody builds in an incentive district, that those are paying for those increased amounts that we'll be asking for for the council. But right now, we're at, as Mike said, a sustainable level with the 800,000. Three years from now, you'll be seeing us come to you and say, we need this for infrastructure, which the council has always been incredibly supportive of. Barb. Thank you. Mike, um, when the developer puts these roads in, are you comfortable with the policies we have in place that it, it seems to me that some of the maintenance issues we have are a little bit premature sometimes? Is that something that we need to look at in the future? We're, we're no, we, we'd look at that as well. And I think what we do is we, as we identify problems that sometimes, as you said, appear to be a little premature, um, we'll look at a cause and then look at a, a, a change in our specifications. And most recently what we did uh, a couple of years ago is we took a look at um, some, of the, some of the things we were seeing were related to the, the subgrade, which is the clay soils we have in, in the city here. We actually had those tested, um, found that they were kind of, uh, they're, they're were some things that we could do to change their natural characteristics to make it more conducive to a more stable roadbed. And so what we, um, what we changed our specification to is uh, a lime stabilization that provides um, a little, it, it changes the chemical nature of the, of the clays to make it more stable. So you'll, that's uh, pretty much automatic now in all new, new development that they have to treat the they have to treat the clay subgrade to make it more sta stable. Doesn't hold moisture as much. Isn't as susceptible to the freeze thaws. It doesn't get as soft in the spring from the you know the winter winter thaws and those type of things. Mr. Berenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On the updated aggregate we're using on the curbs, um, I've noticed, especially in our ward, there are a lot of curbs that have deteriorated, and I obviously can't tell. They, some of them look very new. Are we following up with these newer curbs and to make sure they're holding up as well or better? I, I can tell you what we what we are seeing 
is, we're not we're not seeing the it's relatively new so it's it's you know only been about three years since we've been doing it but I can tell you what what we do see with our uh, quality testing is a significant increase in the strength of the concrete where um, we specify th um, three or four thousand pound per square inch concrete um, and then the typically the you, you cast a cylinder and you cure it for 28 days, that's where the concrete has maximized strength. Uh, with the older aggregate, we would barely see it meeting spec. You know, it, it just meet. Um, with the granite aggregate, it far, far exceeds the minimum specs. You know, we'll see breaks on 4,000 pound concrete that are approaching a 5,000 pounds. So it, it is definitely an improvement. I think long term, Overland Park, who has much more history in this, has, has seen a lot better performance with the curbs and the concrete since they changed to the, the granite aggregate. Then I'll follow up to that first question. I, I know we're really good at treating our roads in the wintertime. Are, are we treating them too often or too heavily? Is, is that contributing to the deterioration of the curbs? I, I think just the natural free thaw cycles do. And yes, the, the, the road salt the, that we do does increase the free thaw cycles. The road, the road salt doesn't impact the concrete what it does is create the opportunities for more three free free saw cycles but it really is a you know a balancing act we've got to keep the road safe for travel versus what are the cumulative potential impacts of a, a few additional free saw cycles and then the last thing is there is there anything that we can do above and beyond what we're doing now as far as sealing these when they're installed uh, I'm, I'm not an expert at concrete and that's why i'm asking you um, are there are there any other products is there anything else we can do above and beyond what we're doing now as far as sealing those curbs when they're installed? We do put a curing, curing compound on them to help them gain, gain strength faster, but I think we're following best practices okay. and, and, and uh, doing, doing all we can. And I think the changeover, I think, in some, <coughs> excuse me, in some of the neighborhoods, we will start seeing more uh, service life on the concrete than we have in, in some of the other areas. Thank you. Just as one final summary statement, uh, the council will note and the public may note uh, when they look at this, you don't see 155th Street on this. It's because 155th Street is a completely separate program from what's being presented to you all tonight. It is still very much on track. We continue to move forward. We're finalizing the last elements with Kansas City relative to them. You may remember my last conversation with you all was we want to see the money. Um, we're still in the we want to see the money stage with them. So we will, as soon as that's finalized, you're going to see us moving forward with more recommendations on that. But it's separate and apart from this if any of your public asks you about it. Because we certainly get calls on it on a regular basis. Good to know. I get asked about it a lot. Yep. And that concludes staff reports tonight, sir. Okay. Thank you. Well, hi, Jay. Good to see you. I'll stop off at the snacks at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, that concludes the three items that we had on the official agenda tonight. Under other, I did want to state that I know I said last time I was going to provide the state of the city address the next council meeting. As it turns out, I didn't realize my schedule was going to, I was going to be with uh, Mr. Tapp in Las Vegas at the conference. At the next meeting, uh, Mr. Moorhead will be presiding. So if, you're, if I could ask for your indulgence, one more cycle. I'll, I'll uh, provide that the first meeting in June. Nobody has any protests to that. Everything okay? All right. Thank you. Mr. Fearborn, anything else? Anybody else have anything? If not, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>